In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are our highly favored, the Lord is with you. <clears throat> Mary was greatly troubled at these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But an angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call his name, him Jesus. Oh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. I'm sorry, Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. So if you can have your Bibles open at uh, Luke chapter 1, um, we're looking at, uh, well, most particularly looking at verses 31 to 33 this morning. I want us to take a brief time this morning to look at the words that were said to Mary by the angel Gabriel. Now those words are incredibly important um, because they are delivered to Mary by one who stands in the presence of God, the archangel or the angel uh, Gabriel. Now, if you know anything of your Bible story, you'll know that Zechariah had a visit from the angel Gabriel, um, and he was foolish enough not to take seriously uh, the words that were delivered to him on that occasion. And Gabriel takes um, some affront at this. Um, and he receives, Zechariah receives, a judgment from God of being mute. Now, in this instance, that meant that he was um, unable to speak. And verse 62 of the same chapter perhaps helps us to understand that he was unable to hear as well. Um, so it was a kind of an all-round uh, understanding. He wouldn't listen to God's word in that sense, so he becomes uh, unable to hear uh, is a, a judgment that is given to him. So we therefore, as we come to these verses, should come, shouldn't we, with a degree of humility. We should come really ready to hear what it is that God has to say to us through the message. Now Mary, who was caught up in the moments, finds it difficult to take it all in. Um, she ponders these things in her heart, we read it at a later date. So uh, there, there is all this message coming at Mary, and she is listening, but maybe it's difficult to take it all on board. But we have a little bit more time, don't we, to sit back and to ponder these words, to think about what these words have to say to us, how they speak into our lives. And we can be um, reflecting upon the significance of this promise to Mary. Um, it must have been quite a thing to meet an angel, mustn't it? Um, quite some experience particularly as he appears as an angel here. He doesn't appear necessarily as a man, as, as angels do in the Bible on other occasions. Uh, he appears as an angelic being. And so that must have been quite something. It must have taken the breath away, as it were. And you can understand that there's a degree of fear. But important though Gabriel is, more important is the one who has sent the message. Now we have to be careful, don't we, that we don't get caught up with the wonder of the scene and forget that the, that the angel, Gabriel, all he is doing is delivering a message that he has been entrusted with. He is a, we would say, a glorified messenger, a truly glorified messenger in that sense. But he is one who comes and simply speaks on the behalf of God. And verse 26 tells us that it is God who has sent Gabriel. He did not come of his own volition. He didn't get up, as it were, one day in heaven and decide, well, what I'm going to do is pop down to earth uh, and I'm going to have a conversation with a random lady from Jerusalem, uh, from, uh, sorry, from Bethlehem. No, not even Bethlehem. Nazareth. Uh, he went to Bethlehem. Um, from Nazareth. 
Um, he didn't do that, did he? He is sent by God. God has a plan in place and he is wanting to send and to speak to Mary because he has been sent to do that. I suspect actually as Gabriel, uh, as it were, makes his way down to this world, and, and I don't know exactly how angels do that, they probably can come fairly instantaneously, um, but however he came, I should imagine as he's coming, he's thinking, well why on earth am I going to this backwater planet? Why on earth am I going to this place? And most particularly, why am I interested in these ant-like annoying people? Uh, you know, we, we don't really sell ourselves, do we? We've only got to turn on our, our news I'll read a newspaper and we discover that we're a pretty despicable lot, really, aren't we? Um, all around the world, all the news that we ever hear never seems to be terribly good, does it? And if you are the angel Gabriel and you're coming out of the splendour of God's presence, you're coming to this world, that's got to be a pretty big step down, hasn't it? Uh, to come and to speak to us, even to just one of us. Now, whatever he wonders, God sent him. And more than that, he sent him with an extraordinary message. Now Mary has been chosen, not through any merit of her own. We need to get that in our understanding. Mary is not someone spectacular that uh, God would, uh, as it were, visit her because of something that she has done. She is just an ordinary girl. She's an ordinary young woman. She is just carrying on her, her normal everyday life. Now she may be seeking to follow God in a way, uh, but she wasn't perfect. Uh, she wasn't holy, and, and so therefore God could communicate with her, but she was one that, well, yes, she was looking to the things of God, and she, we certainly see by her life that she's interested in following God. But she has shown favour because God in his Mercy and in his grace decides to show that favour. And that appearing takes Mary by surprise, doesn't it? In, in actual fact, any favour that we get from God should take us by surprise, shouldn't it? You know, we get used to living in uh, our uh, Western world and we've got so many good things and so many blessings that we tend to take them for granted. But, you know, actually we should be amazed, shouldn't we, that God comes towards us in, in love in any way? That he shows us favour in any way because the Bible declares to us time and time again that we are, well, that our hearts are wicked. Uh, that the, the bent of our lives is never towards God, it's always away from him. And so therefore, when God shows us favour, that's, that's an astounding thing. And so as we look at this scene, we should be feeling with Mary something of the wonder of it, that God would communicate with her, and actually with us, as we gather to consider these things this morning. But what is exactly the favour that is being shown to Mary, and, and uh, in a sense to us as well? Well, the first thing that we discover is that she's going to have a child called Jesus. Now, I talked uh, in the Thought for the Day, I don't know whether any of you are following those, but Thought for the Day, which had been put up on YouTube on Thursday, about Mary's shock at the thought of having a baby. She was not keen on the implication that she would have to have premarital sex. There is a horror in her hearing what God has to say, and that grating on the life that she is living. She is one who is seeking to live before God as she should. And the thought, as this angel tells her that she's going to have a baby, well, she's in no position to have a baby. And it actually shocks her. It, it makes her think, you know, in trepidation, how can this possibly be? But God, in, in verse 35, helps her through Gabriel to understand that the baby will come about supernaturally, not conventionally. Okay, so God isn't coming to Mary and, and telling her that she's got to get about the business of producing a baby. God is coming to her and telling her that the baby is coming, and it's coming because of a work of God. That he will form this child in Mary's womb. And she, in a sense, will not have a big part to play in that at all. This is a gift that she is going to receive 
that she is going to receive and it's going to be entirely of God's doing. And it isn't a surprise that this is going to happen, is it? I doubt that Mary brought this, brought this text to mind, but we could go to Isaiah 7 uh, and verse 14, couldn't we? We could say that, uh, we could read that, and it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive, and she will give birth to a son, and uh, will call him Emmanuel. Well, Emmanuel means God with us, doesn't it? Well, having a child is big news, isn't it? It's big news for anyone who discovers that they are pregnant. Uh, And usually if you're a a woman in in that particular situation, um, and it is women that have babies, um, we'll address that one just there, Uh, it's women that have babies, um, and usually you get excited about that, don't you? Particularly if it's planned, if this has come uh, as something that you're looking forward to, you get excited, and you really want to tell everyone about it, don't you? You know, it, it's, it's, it's there and, and the baby's growing inside you and you want to tell everyone just how wonderful it is that you are going to have a child. But you know, sometimes if you discover that you're going to have a baby and it comes out of the blue, it can be a little bit unsettling, can't it? Uh, you know, you're going on your life and uh, suddenly uh, you discover, I mean, there might be some of those early signs that you're pregnant, um, and you suddenly discover that you are pregnant, and that can be that can throw you into confusion. It throws all sorts of people, particularly if it's something that they weren't expecting to happen. It can be destabilizing in that way. Now, children are a gift from the Lord, but you know sometimes the gift can seem overwhelming. You know, we celebrate having children. That's a wonderful thing to do. It's what God has has put us here to do to, to uh, make children, as it were, to have children. It's a wonderful thing. But you know, sometimes that gift can be a little bit overwhelming. It can take you uh, and knock you for six. While Mary here is completely knocked for six. She's completely at, at pieces about what's going on. And she's trying to listen carefully to what the angel is saying to her. Yet she's just discovered that she's going to have a baby. And that's mind-blowing. But one of the pleasures of having a child is the business of naming them, isn't it? Perhaps you didn't find that a joy, but it is one of the things that you get to do. If you're a parent, you get to pick the name of your child, and then your child has to live with that, depending on what it is, but, um, but it is an opportunity for you to name them. And that can be a bit of a process, can't it? You've got nine months to do it in, or more or less nine months, depends on when you discover that you're pregnant, but more or less nine months... Um, And then you discover that there are some that need extra time after the nine months. So they have the baby and then they can't tell you what the name of the baby is because the nine months months weren't long enough to work out what the name uh, was going to be. But naming a baby is quite special. Yet here we discover that Mary isn't going to be the one that names the baby. In fact, neither is Joseph going to be the one who names the baby. The baby's name is already decided. His name will be Jesus. This gift comes with a name already. And Mary is told that his name will be Jesus. And now, names were very important back in, in Mary's time, uh, much more so than now, although we often look in to see what the name uh, means before we give it to our children, don't we? We, we check out to make sure that we're not going to give them a something which doesn't quite uh, match with our, our uh, view, as it were. Well, the name that Jesus is given is the Greek version of Joshua, isn't it? Or Yeshua. And what it means is the Lord saves. So even before this gift is given, there is an understanding of what's going to happen. He's coming to rescue. He's coming to save. So there's even more reason to be excited about the birth of this child. And it's confirmed, isn't it, to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. Uh, You know, there's that whole issue of uh, Mary is now pregnant and Joseph is uh, saying, well, hang on a minute, I'm not the dad, so um, there's a problem here. Uh, But he's a very gracious and kind man, so he's going to put Mary away, he's going to divorce her. Um, uh, 
in the, in the way that it worked if you were engaged to someone then, you were engaged and it was a commitment that had been made and so the only way out of that was to uh, file for a divorce. And so there is Joseph contemplating this divorce before he's even actually got really married. And God in his grace uh, comes to him in a vision and he says this, uh, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. You're beginning to get an understanding now. Maybe Gabriel's beginning to work this one out as he is, he's delivering a lot of these messages. He's beginning to understand that the reason that he's come to this backwater place to deliver a message is there is a people who are desperately in need of rescue. There are people who are living in sin. And by that I don't just mean they're living together. I mean that there are things in their lives which are against God. Which shouldn't be there. And a holy God has to deal with those sins. He has to uh, deal with them. They have to be dealt with. They have to be, actually the Bible says, punished. And so we should get super excited, shouldn't we, about the fact that we're hearing of a child who is coming who will rescue his people, who will come and save them from their sin. Mary's child would not just come to make Mary a proud mum, but he was coming with a mission. His very name telling us that his mission was from God. The Lord saves. Psalm 130 and verses 7 to 8. <clears throat> we were told there, Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for the Lord is unfailing love and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. There's a promise that God will rescue us from our sin. And however that would be accomplished, Mary is beginning to understand that Jesus has come to bring that about. So we have a child whose name is Jesus, but we also have a child who is the Son of God. Now there were Old Testament prophecies that would uh, that God Himself would have rescued. We just read a couple. Um, that one we read just a few moments ago. Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign: the virgin will conceive and give you a uh, give you will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Or there's Isaiah 59 and verses 15 and 16. The Lord looked and was disappointed that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him. And his own righteousness sustained him. Mary here is told that her child will be the son of the Most High. This is God come. Uh, taking that in must have been quite something for Mary, mustn't it? That she is going to have the Son of God. Uh, that God's own Son would come in flesh in her midst. And the reference to the Most High would take us to Daniel 7. Uh, the one in control of all things, including the plan of salvation for his people. As people have gone through the Old Testament and they've looked forward to this one who would come and rescue, the Messiah who would come, the promised one, the anointed one. Well, they knew he was coming from God, but many missed the understanding that he would be God. God himself would come and walk in our midst. He would be just like us. He would come and live a life that you and I would recognise that, okay, we live in a very uh, 20th, uh, 21st century world in, in which there is so much uh, around us, uh, cars and all those kind of things. He didn't see all of those things, but he came and he lived a normal life. So if we'd have been there at that time, we would have lived a life just like he 
lived. And he, he lived and experienced everything that we experience. And he felt every temptation that we feel in our lives. Yet the reality is... In, all, in the face of all of those things where we cave in and give in and we simply follow our desires, our inner desires, Jesus was able to stand against them. And yes, he stood against them because he was God, but he also stood against them because he was human. And he stood in that, as it were, in those two positions of both 100% human and 100% man, and God in his spirit enabled him to stay pure. To never sin. Now that's astonishing, isn't it? That we wish we could never sin. You know, we, we look at our family lives and they're all going so well. And, uh, and then some, one of our children does something wrong or, or our, our spouse upsets us. And you, we can feel the anger boiling within us, can't we? And within a few moments, we've gone from being this lovely picture of family life to being, well, someone who wants to kick the dog and throttle the children and do away with the wife. It, it, you know, it, <laughs> and the reality is, you know, we might think, well, that's all out there. That's all somebody else's problem. But the reality is it's here in, in us, isn't it? It doesn't take a moment for us to throw aside all caution and simply to live as we Please, and to be governed by our own inner desires. And that leads to a mess. And here comes the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one who is able to live a perfect life, the only one who is able to live a, a life which brings glory and praise to God. You know, I often pray on a Sunday that we would go from here and we would live lives that bring glory and praise to God. But you know, the only life that ever has brought glory and praise to God in any real way is the Lord Jesus Christ. When we go from here, we simply live in the strength of Christ. Our offerings go through Christ and are made right. So the Lord Jesus is the perfect one. He comes as God to live in human flesh. He comes to dwell amongst us. And I want you to get your head around that for a moment. That God came and he walked on this earth. And he experienced your life. It is a thing most wonderful, almost too wonderful to be. That God's own son should come from heaven and die to save a child like me. Uh, William uh, Wilson Howe wrote that hymn. But that's what we ought to stop and do, isn't it? Think and just be amazed that God would send his son. That God would send his son for us and send him on a mission that would ultimately mean that we need to give his life in order that our sins might be forgiven. That's astonishing. Why would God love us in that way? Why would he care? I'm not sure I can even answer that question for you. All I know is he does. And that he has demonstrated that in sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Such a value that he places on mankind that he would come to rescue us. We who are self-absorbed, hard-hearted enemies of the living God. And he came anyway. Third thing is he is a child who is the son of David. We see that in the text. Uh, 2 Samuel says this. Uh, 2 Samuel 7 and 11 to 16, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. Uh, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be his father, and he will be my son. And when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men and uh, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house 
and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Hundreds of years before Jesus comes, there is a promise made to David. David gets super excited. He wants to please God. He, he's like us. He wants to do those things that you're right. And he says, look, I'm going to build a house for you, God. He sees the tent. You know, he's living in a glorious palace. And the, and the temple of God is nothing more than a tent. And he thinks, well, God can't dwell in a tent. That's, that, that's just wrong. Here I am in a palace. And God should be in something much greater than a tent. And so he gets it in his heart that he wants to build a, a temple. And so he begins to gather together all of the wealth he can from everywhere, all the building materials that he's ever going to need to build this wonderful temple. And yet God says, actually, you're not going to be the man that builds me a temple. He says, your son will do it. Now, immediately we understand that that means that Solomon, his son, will do it. But these words are so much bigger than Solomon, aren't they? They're pointing us to the one who would come and be the forever king. The one who would be uh, the son of David. The, the true descendant who would have a kingdom. Gabriel is telling Mary that her son will fulfill this prophe prophecy. He is making it plain that because she is in David's line and Jesus will be too, he is great David's greater son. So David was the great king. And even if you go to Israel now and you talk to Jews, they talk about David and they tell you how wonderful he was. But sadly, so many of them are missing the one who was coming after him, who was going to be a greater king than he would ever be. They're missing Jesus. It's about a thousand years between the prophecy and the fulfilment. Which is astonishing, isn't it? Because you couldn't get a better description of what Jesus is going to be like. He is going to be the king who reigns, yet he's going to be punished by man. In order that we might be saved. Are you amazed? We have it every year, don't we? We get uh, Christmas comes around year after year after year, and I think we just get used to it, don't we? You know, we got cross last year because we couldn't have it in the way that we wanted it. And this year we're getting a little bit up, unsettled because, you know, these restrictions are coming back. And, and what we want to do is get together with our family and friends and, and enjoy ourselves. But have you got it yet? God himself came in human flesh as the fulfillment of promises made at least a thousand years before. And he completely fulfills all of the words. Great David's greater son. Now Jesus, as David's son, helps us to know that God's word is trustworthy. And that we can build our lives upon it. You know, there are many books that we like to read. I don't know what sort of things you're into reading. And we get excited about them, but you know there are none that are as solid, uh, as trustworthy as the Bible. There's no other book that you can build your life upon and know that it will stand secure. So I urge you to read it because of great David's greater son. And the fourth thing that we see in the passage is a child who is king. The second reason that Jesus is a descendant of David is so that he can fulfill that promise made to David that he would never fail to have one of his descendants on his throne. Uh, 1 Kings 8 verse 25. Now the Lord, the God of Israel, keep for you, for your servant David, my father. Let me try that again. My, now, Lord, the God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, the promise that you made to him when you said you shall never fail to have a successor to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your descendants are careful in all that they do to walk before me faithfully as you have done. That's one of David's sons that is declaring that God keep his promise. And, and now we know that he's kept 
his promise. And we are told in our text, aren't we? Luke chapter 1 and verse 33. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. What is so special about this king is he will be a king forever. It therefore matters, doesn't it, what type of king he is? If you can have a king who rules forever and a king who ultimately rule, rules with no, uh, no one to contest his throne, what sort of a king do you want? Uh, we get uh, a little bit, uh, I don't know whether you're amused or whether you're annoyed or whether you're upset or, or what it is, but when you hear about our Prime Minister and all the shenanigans that go on, I, you know, I think most of us just go, huh. Um, but actually, it's... It's sorrowful, isn't it, that we do have someone that leads our nation who you can't trust? You know, whatever we think of him, he's not alone. I think probably you could put just about any one of our politicians in that place and we'd all go, mm. The reality is if we're going to have a king, we want a king that we can trust, don't we? A king is righteous in all that he does. A king that can lead us in our lives in godly ways. A king that will lead us right into heaven. Right into his glorious kingdom. In the Old Testament, kings were either compared to David, if they were a good king, or to Omri or Ahab, if they were bad kings. And Omri and Ahab did some of the most atrocious things that a king could ever do. And Micah says, uh, as he's talking about uh, the people of the nation of Israel, you have observed the statutes of Omri and the practices of Ahab's house. You have followed their traditions. Therefore, I will give you over to ruin and your people to derision. You will hear the scorn of the nation. You know, when we follow God, ungodly kings and we follow their ungodly ways, we walk ourselves into judgment. That's what God's telling us. But if we are to follow this king, this forever king, Jesus Christ, then not only will our sins be forgiven, but we can have a part in an eternity which will last, as eternity should do, forever but it will be full of righteousness. It will be a place of justice. It will be a place of glory and of splendor. All because the king who reigns is righteous and glorious and splendid. I went to see uh, Hillary. Uh, she was singing last night in the uh, Messiah over at uh, Christchurch Priory. Uh, very good singing, Hillary. Um, But you, I don't know whether you've been to see it or heard it, but these words, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and a government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government, and peace there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. Establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. It's difficult for me not to burst into song. Singing those, hearing those words. Wonderful counsellor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. And Prince of Peace. I trust that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour. I trust that he is your forever King. Because if he's not, now is the time to make it right with him. Now is the time to, to as it were, you can do it physically, but certainly you need to do it uh, spiritually. Bend your knees, bow your knees. Get on the floor and grovel before him and say that you would be my sovereign, that you would be my king. Because when I follow you, when I live with you, 
then I know that all things will be for my glory and ultimately for your glory. Sovereign God. Let me urge you, if you have not, to turn to him this morning. Why is this all important to us? Will Jesus be your king? Or will you continue to try to be king in your own life? There can only be one king. And that, my friend, will not be you. But it will be the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And we look forward to we don't to, to we look forward to, don't we, his return? When he comes as the king that he is, with his hosts following him to welcome into his kingdom every one of those who have bowed the knee now. If you say to me, Well, I don't really want Jesus as my king. I'm never going to bow my knee to him. Well, you need to face up to the reality. The Bible declares this, that every knee will bow. At the moment, you have a choice. When he comes back, you will have none. Because he will be the king who reigns supreme. Are you ready for him? Are you ready for him? Let's pray, shall we? A loving Heavenly Father, as we've considered that wonderful message which is given to Mary, Lord, we acknowledge that she takes that on board. That's such a huge message to, to uh, really understand. But we thank you, Lord, that we've had opportunity just to consider it this morning. And we pray, Lord, ha having a little bit more time to consider it, that we would be those that respond in faith. That we would trust that Jesus Christ is the Saviour of mankind. That we would trust that he is the forever king. And that we would willingly bow the knee now. Move in us, we pray. And change and transform our lives. For the glory and praise of our precious Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.